Today's Entour Live webinar will be looking at the fascinating world of ants and specifically how ants navi navigate. So over to Paul to explain to us how to be a champion navigator with a small brain. Thanks, Kieran. Uh, first of all, uh, many thanks for the invitation. It's fantastic to have a big audience like this uh, and obviously especially on such a, a beautiful day when we could be all outside actually looking at ants like the ones I'm going to be talking about. So my story into becoming an ant enthusiast is probably quite different to many people. I actually originally started interested in neuroscience and how to build uh, robots with the brains uh, of animals that had intelligent behavior. Uh, and as you do that, you start to realize that there's more and more biology that you need to know before you can do that. And the next thing you know, you've spent 25 years studying the brains of ants and the navigation behaviors of ants to try and understand that special skill that they have to move through the world so accurately. So I'll build up to talking about ants as the champion navigators, but we've got to put this kind of research into a little bit of context. So all organisms, or most organisms and certainly all animals uh, have to navigate. They've got to move through the world in order to be in the right location for food, safety, mating, etc. And that's independent of the brain size. So humans have got very large brains. We're renowned for that. So last count, we've got 85 billion neurons to play with for all of the things that we do. Uh, but down at the bottom, you've got animals with very small brains or almost no brains at all. So this zooplankton at this stage in its life, it's uh, the uh, larval stage of a platinaris worm, uh, it's got no brain to speak of at all. So developmentally, it's growing its first two neurons, but it still has to navigate even before those neurons have finished growing across the, the what will become the brain of the animal. And somewhere right in the middle, right in the sweet spot, uh, uh, between the large brains and the small brains, we have insects like uh, bees and ants, the social insects. So the larger brained insects uh, that might have a brain size of approximately a million neurons. So we see amazing behaviors from insects in this kind of range, uh, despite the fact that their brains were 100,000 times smaller than the brains of, of a human. But let's go to the navigation skills first of this platinaris zooplankton. So in this kind of marine environment, one of the most important things uh, for a, a larval a zooplankton to do is to stay safe. And one of the things you need to do is to regulate temperature. So you need to be in the warm parts of the water. And because you don't have much of a brain, there's not much you can do in order to make decisions about where to go. What these platinary zooplankton do have, though, is they have little eye spots. So they're not image forming eyes like our eyes, uh, but they are slightly sensitive to light. And there's one on each side of the body. And there's also this lovely little skirt of pulsating hairs that propel the zooplankton forward through the water. So that's all it's got to play with. It's got some way of moving, but not very accurately. And it's got some way of detecting light. But looking for the zooplankton, if you're in the water, light is a good predictor of temperature. So if you can aim towards the light, then maybe you can stay in the warmer waters, which is safer. So how do we do that? Well, without any neurons, you can still have some chemical signaling in your proto brain. So the eye spots on the side detect light, and they release a chemical if they have large amounts of light, and that inhibits the movement of the nearby hair cells on this skirt. So this zooplankton here has light stimulating the eye spot on the right as we look at it, uh, and so the hair cells on the right will beat less. But the ones on the left are not inhibited, and so the organism will turn to the right. If the light was on the other side, these hair cells on the left would be inhibited, uh, the hair cells on the right would not be, and we would turn left. So without a brain, we can do one of the most simple forms of navigation. It's called phototaxis in this particular case. But a taxis in general is the ability to steer towards a particularly sensory cue. And obviously we know it's not too sophisticated and doesn't depend on neurons too much because this is the kind of movement that we would see in plants as well. But what about the next step up? What about animals that have to do something slightly more sophisticated than just steering towards the light? So here we've got one of the champions of moving in a straight line. So moving in a straight line is an important behavior for many animals. And the reason uh, these dung beetles need to move in a straight line is because they invest quite a lot of time in building a large dung ball. So when there's a big pat 
to exploit. They'll fly in, uh, make a ball, and then they need to get away from that pat as quickly as possible to avoid competitors stealing that ball. And they want to go away, bury the ball, and use it for food and for raising young. Competition is very kind of fast and aggressive uh, in these beetles. So here we see a ball being rolled away as quick as possible with a little pursuant in there and then a little fight. And unfortunately, the original beetle that made the ball loses out. And despite all of its best efforts, uh, the, the animal that's stolen the ball appears to be winning in the subsequent fight. So the best thing you can do is to set a straight line and to go as fast as possible. Obviously, it needs to be a straight line because that gives you the maximum displacement from the place that you originally started. So how do animals like these dung beetles uh, set that straight line course? Well, there's been lots of work done, mainly from groups in Sweden. But here we've got just a few data points from uh, nocturnal dung beetles. So here, the representation of the data is that the, the dung ball and the beetle are placed at the middle of this arena. And then there's a camera above and it tracks the beetle as the beetle will try and roll in a straight line to get away from this location. So you can see that the actual direction that the animal takes is not really important. They choose an arbitrary direction. The important thing is that they try to set a straight line. And if the moon is out, uh, then they're very good at that. But if there's no moon uh, and you don't have any uh, and you occlude the stars, then what you see is this very maladaptive behavior that we, that we wouldn't want to see, where individuals are looping around and they're taking a lot longer to get further away from that start location, which would mean they'd be much more likely to have their dung ball stolen. Interestingly for this species, if there's still no moon present, but you have a starry night where we can see a sort of feature like the Milky Way, then we see that the paths are much, much straighter. So not quite as straight as when the animal had the moon, but much straighter. So in that case, we can see that the uh, animal is able to use the features provided by the sky, in this case, the Milky Way, in order to try and set that straight line course. So that simple demonstration of dung beetles and their beautiful ball rolling behavior shows us that external sensory information is essential for most forms of navigation. And we know that's true because if you remove external sensory information like these blind, blindfolded humans, then something as simple as trying to walk in a straight line for approximately 25 meters becomes very challenging at all. So subject number three is the best at this task, uh, but some subjects are, as you can see, remarkably bad at straight line walking. We can take a slightly more scientific perspective on straight line walking in humans to show how difficult it is. Uh, here's examples where subjects are in the forest and they're simply asked to walk in a straight line and they have accurate GPS tracking. When, the, when it's a cloudy day, subjects are very bad. That's this cluster of trajectories at the bottom here. But on sunny days, you can see that people are okay, albeit these paths are you know, slightly curved. In the same uh, experimental team, they took uh, these subjects uh, to a large beach. So this was one of these huge beaches that you get uh, when the tide goes far out, uh, very flat. Uh, and again, blindfolded humans this time and asked them to walk in a straight line. So the experimental question here was whether or not people would use any information that was available. So we can tell that when the sun's out, people can walk roughly in a straight line. Here, the only useful information is the steady breeze that comes in off the sea. Uh, so here we can see the paths of subjects and they're really bad. So these poor people are walking in massive loops on this beach. And afterwards, the experimenters said to them, why didn't you just simply use the wind in order to walk in a straight line? Uh, and then the subject reported, I couldn't do that because the wind kept changing direction. So these loops uh, meant the people thought they were going straight and the wind was moving, but actually it was the other way around. So walking in a straight line is quite hard. You have to be tuned in to the, uh, the sensory information uh, that's useful, uh, but it's not really the complex navigation that we see in some animals, including humans. In complex navigation, you might have arbitrary locations that you have to get back to, not just steering a straight line. 
and you might have to get back from different uh, places and you might have to re make repeated journeys between your nest location, for instance, and some food. So it's not just about aiming towards sensory information when the sun is out or when a new uh, dung uh, mound appears. This is you perhaps having to get back to your nest or your home, so a central place forager. So for animals like this, navigation is really important. Otherwise, uh, you're either going to starve or lose uh, your nest. So one of the features of, of the science of trying to study the mechanisms behind behavior is this idea of Heiligenberg's rule. So Heiligenberg highlighted that for the behavior you're interested in, you should study the champion animal. So you should find a species or group of species which are prodigious in the thing you're trying to understand. And they'll be the ones that are easiest to study and they'll be the ones where it's easiest to access information about that behavior. And so as hinted at in the title of the talk, our champion animal when it comes to navigation and moving through the world are the social insect foragers. And specifically today, I'm gonna to be talking about ants. So why are they champions? Well, being a social insect means that you can have a forager cast. You can have individuals whose only task it is to retrieve food and then re uh, bring it back to the hive or nest. And because when they get there, they give that food away, that means they're instantly motivated to go back on another foraging run. And so when you look at the foraging behavior of an ant or a bee, you see many more runs per day than you would do if you were looking at the foraging behavior of a solitary animal. That means that every aspect of their navigation should be optimized to increase the efficiency of that foraging. It also makes them easier to study because we can monitor individuals and track them over their lifetime. And so scientifically, they're very useful in that sense also. This particular beautiful creature is a desert ant from Australia, Melophorus bagotti, uh, and she'll feature in some of the studies that I'll talk about later. This is a piece of biscuit, so it's not natural forage, uh, but it is something that she's very happy to have. And she's just about to leave to return back to her nest with this uh, piece of cookie crumb that she's just found. So the navigation that animals produce has to be done, you know, with the brains that they have. So in our ants, the brains are slightly smaller than the honeybee I, I showed you earlier. That's because they don't need as much machinery to do with flight. Uh, but they're still quite, you know, interestingly large at 500,000 neurons for instance. So it's a beautiful picture from Würzburg group showing the different brain areas in an ant brain. Uh, adding up to about half a million neurons. So this particular image is a slice taken down through uh, the, the head like this. Uh, so these are the eyes. So we're looking at the front, the nose, if, if a fence had a nose. Here are the uh, parts where the antenna meet the brain, the antenna lobes, and here are the optical areas with the compound eye on the outside here. So this whole brain, 500,000 neurons, it's small, but it's still a more complex neural structure than anything anybody in the planet understands right now. So it's one of the most complicated objects that we might hope to understand in the next 10 years in any type of science, not just in uh, ethology and neuroscience. And if we think about how we study human brains with their 85 billion neurons, then what we like to do with humans is to stick them in scanners. So this is an image from an fMRI scanner. So it's magnetic resonance imaging, but in this case, tuned to the changes in blood oxygen so that you can detect which areas of the brain are working. So when you have a 3D scan of the brain, we call the areas light up voxels because it's like a 3D pixel. So it's a volume of a pixel. So when we're studying human brains, we put people in scanners and we ask them to do different cognitive tasks and we see which area of the brain lights up. Each of these voxels, which is the smallest unit by which we can hope to understand human brains, is three times larger than the entire ant brain that we're looking at here. So that's the scale of the brain that's available to ants compared to humans. So one of the features of many ant species, especially the particularly good navigators, is that they're actually individual foragers. So often if we talk about ant navigation, I'm sure many of you might have uh, thought that there may be some consideration to pheromones and the way that socially and collectively an ant colony 
could learn about the environment and share that information via the stigmergic effect of pheromone accumulation on the substrate. But actually, many ant species forage individually because they might be in a habitat like this, which is very hot and pheromones wouldn't uh, uh, stand for very long on any substrate. And so the individuals evolved to be solitary foragers, but in a social context, if that doesn't uh, sound like an oxymoron. So it's also true that most ants that do use pheromones actually still learn all of the individual information they need to navigate as well. So it's a robust mechanism where often the social information from the pheromone is a safety net uh, for foragers who haven't learned anything yet, but also for experienced foragers should they get lost. So in general, all of the things I'll talk about today are actually features of navigation across nearly all ant species, apart from maybe those ants that have very, very limited vision. So the task for a forager like this, this is a beautiful North African desert ant, Cataclyphus fortis, is to find other arthropods that have succumbed to the heat in the desert. So these are thermophilic ants that forage at the time of day when it's too hot for nearly all other animal species. And they're hoping that they'll find dead bodies. So here is beautiful data from Cornelia Bullman, who's a colleague, but this was work that she did when she was uh, in Vienna. And here we've got a nest of uh, ants and they're going out into the, uh, into the salt pan uh, and then looking for dead arthropods and then coming back. So first thing to know is just the scale. So the navigational routes of these ants are huge. So millions of body lengths, uh, the maximum routes in this uh, sample were almost two kilometers. And interestingly, uh, a two kilometer navigational route, which is quite a challenge for a small animal, as I'm sure you agree, and might lead to something just as tiny as this. So the tiniest little bit uh, of a dead uh, insect that you've managed to retrieve after two kilometers of effort. So if you're trying to find food in the desert, then obviously you need some strategy, you need some way of uh, maximizing your chances of finding these tiny objects distributed over this huge area of salt pan. Food is detected in these desert ants uh, via necromones, so the pheromones that are released uh, and the chemicals that are released uh, by dead uh, arthropods. And we can see in these examples that these odor plumes released by the insects are necessary in order to find that food and that the food can't be detected visually. So these paler trajectories here are ants that walked very close to a food source here, but didn't detect it because the wind direction is from right to left as we look at it. And so only the ants that are in this area to the side would find the food because they saunter into the, to the odor plume. So, here we've got the innate behavior of knowing which odors are related to food. The detection of those odors can then lead you upwind to the food source. If you want to maximize the chances of finding food that way, then you need to walk perpendicular to the wind direction. So from that data set uh, I showed you earlier, Cornelia extracted sections where uh, ants are walking perpendicular to the wind. And they do this for quite large proportions of their foraging routes, which increases massively their chance of detecting food. So here we've got two lovely innate behaviors, recognizing food odors uh, and innately moving perpendicular to the wind to increase your chances of moving into an odor plume. What do you do when you've found a food item? Well, of course, the thing is you want to get back to your nest uh, as rapidly as possible, ideally on a straight line. And so now we have another innate mechanism that ants can use to do that navigation back to their nest, which might take them across an area that they've never traveled before. And the mechanism is called path integration, sometimes referred to as dead reckoning, which is the term that was used by mariners who would do something similar before we had more sophisticated navigational technology. So path integration requires an animal to keep track of the distance and direction of each segment of its route. And if you can do that, then trigonometry allows you to keep a permanent estimate of the direct path that you should take uh, to get back to the starting point of your journey, which is usually your nest. So if you've got distance and direction and you can do trigonometry, then you've got path integration as a very neat navigational mechanism. 
and it means you can explore novel areas that you've never been in previously. We can do a more thorough experimental demonstration of path integration here. So this is the outward path on the right, the meandering tortuous outward path uh, of a cataclyphic and beetle, or I think in this example, and at this point at the top, the first open circle, uh, the ant was given a small piece of food, but at the same time, a mischievous scientist picks the ant up in a small dark vial, moves her 20 meters to the side and then releases her with a food item. And what you see is this beautiful straight trajectory, which is exactly the right direction and distance that she would have needed to get back to her nest had she not been displaced by the scientist. When the nest isn't there, she starts to search. So we know from this demonstration that this route is dependent on this outward route and isn't driven directly by any sensory information that she can detect from the real nest, which is over here. So what do you need to be able to do path integration? Uh, well, you've got to have two extra sensory modalities. You've got to have some way of measuring distance or speed, and you have to have some way of measuring direction. And you have to have some way of measuring direction that's independent of the time of day. So this is a rather gruesome experiment, uh, but it does rather neatly show uh, that ants count their steps, have some approximation of step counting as a method of knowing how far they're traveling. So in this example, ants were allowed to uh, walk down a channel to find food. And then once they had food, they were taken away and had one of two experimental manipulations. They either had pig bristle glued to their legs so that they were walking on stilts, so they had longer strides, or they had the, the small tip of their legs clipped off, uh, so they had a shorter stride, but these ants still happily will walk around. You then take them to another channel, release them, uh, and in the control group, the ants with food uh, will run back the exact distance that should have taken them back to their nest, and then they'll start to search for the nest in that channel. The Ants on stilts walk further and the ants on stumps walk less far, but the approximate number of steps is the same in all three groups. So it's a neat demonstration that step counting is important for a navigating ant. So how do ants know their direction? Well, there are lots of uh, cues in the sky which help you understand direction. And direction's easy to get as long as you have some internal body clock so you know roughly what time of day it is. So in the sky, there are light gradients between blue and green, which give some indication. There's polarization patterns in the sky. Also, at nighttime, there's features that many insects use. But of course, the major feature during the day, and certainly the main feature for a desert ant, would be the sun. And we know that the sun is crucial for orientation in ants from really beautiful work done in the turn of the century by Felix Sanchi, who was an observational uh, an observer uh, and expert, which he did in his spare time from being a doctor in North Africa. And the really beautiful experiment that first showed us this demonstration that the sun is important for direction was done by Sanchi, who would find ants returning from a foraging run, and he would have a mirror and a piece of board. And he would find the ant and he would block the direction of the sun from the perspective of the ant, so put the ant in shadow, so to speak, uh, and then mirror the sun so it appeared to come from the opposite direction. So he would approach an ant, put the card, the board, and the mirror in place, and you'll see here that quite often uh, the ant would then beautifully U-turn. So, and then when he takes the board and mirror away, the ant resumes that journey there. So the direction that that ant was setting was defined uh, really nicely by the sun position and could be toggled very easily by Sanji. So we've got a sun compass and a step counter that add to path integration. And path integration turns out to be a universal strategy across nearly all animals. So here's data from hamsters, dogs, and humans. And you can see that in this very simple triangle completion task where uh, animals are led across these first two legs and then asked to get back to the start, that you see animals are pretty good. You often see this, just an, it's not really important for today's lecture, but it's just an interesting point. Anybody who does orienteering will recognize this strategy. Hamsters and dogs would actually be much better at path integration, but they always make sure they miss on the same side. So one of the clever aspects of navigation is not just having an accurate estimate of direction, but also making sure you know which way you're going to be wrong. So if you always aim a bit 
to the side of something, you know that when you get to where you think it should be, you should bias your search to the left in these examples. So path integration is basically our sense of direction. So when we go into a complicated department store and we wander around without view of the sky, uh, and then we want to get back to the door that would lead us to the car park, having some sense of which direction that is, is our use of path integration. And obviously I imagine some of you are thinking, well, we're not very good at that, uh, but we can see that humans are okay generally on average, but there is this variability. So in this navigation task here, there are some errors. This is data from a dog doing a triangle completion task. And again, the dog misses the goal and starts to search around. So the problem with path integration is that there are always going to be some errors. And so, you know, for instance, I'm currently about three miles from Brighton Pier, and it's roughly in a southwest direction. If I were to move to walk out and walk exactly three miles southwest, I wouldn't be at the pier. And so my only me method of getting to the pier from where I thought it should be would be to search for it. So there's always errors in this kind of strategy. So how do ants get around that? Well, they mitigate errors by forming habits. Here's a beautiful data set. These are all foraging paths from one individual cataclypist ant. Uh, and we're looking at the times that she discovers food in the desert. The numbers relate to a, a food item that she's discovered. And you see that she starts to bias her foraging to the south after on runs 25, 27, 29, and 30, she finds food in this area. And so over time, she becomes a specialist in navigating to this foraging ground. And when you do that, it allows you to start learning things about your environment. Once you travel repeatedly through an environment, you then start to demonstrate these idiosyncratic or habitual routes. And we see that in most ant species. So this is uh, data from the Australian desert ant that I showed you earlier. These gray areas are grass tussocks, and this is data from one individual that's returning from a feeder back to a nest. And you can see that although there's some variability, there's a characteristic shape by which she always navigates along that certain route. And these routes are really robust. If you capture her at the nest just before she's about to go in and put her back at the middle of the route, then she will recapitulate the second half of the route with the same shape. And this proves to us that she wasn't using path integration information to do that route because we've uh, totally messed up the path integration by magically transporting her back to this point here. If you take her from the feeder and do a fast forward so that she appears magically at the middle of that route, then you see, again, she recapitulates the same shapes. And here this shows us that she doesn't have to have experienced all of this part of the world in order to know what to do here. These kind of idiosyncratic habitual routes are actually really common across the animal kingdom. Here's more data from ants where we see uh, in the cyan ants moving to the feeder. So this is just, sorry, one ant moving to the feeder. These are repeated uh, foraging runs. And she always goes this way to get to the feeder, but always comes this different way back, very reliable. If we look across pigeons, monkeys, humans, and rats, we see very similar uh, ideas that individuals when they're traveling through a familiar area will stick to idiosyncratic routes. This is a beautiful example here. If you repeatedly release pigeons, homing pigeons from the same location, and then this is their home loft here, then they actually develop and stick to idiosyncratic routes. Even though they're pigeons, they could fly in the straight line back to the, to the home loft in the quickest route if they wanted to. So this shows that they'd, they'd rather have accurate navigation by using visual features on the ground than take the quickest route, which might be harder to navigate along. From this data set, we learn that pigeons are very fond of following features such as forest edges and roads in order to simplify the navigational task. So if you are gonna form a habit of how you move through the world, then you need to learn things. So our path integration and our detection of odors for food and moving relative to the wind, they're all innate strategies that foragers can do on day one of their foraging lives. But if you want to have habitual routes through the world, then you need to learn some things. And we know a little bit, you know, we have done for a long time, know how this might pan out, uh, not least from demonstrations by people like von Frisch and Timbergen. So here, Timbergen, uh, 
had a digger wasp. Her nest is this this dark area at the middle. Uh, and she was inside. She knew he knew that she'd come back with from a foraging run previously, and so she was in the nest. And while she was in there, he took some nearby pine cones and placed them in a ring around the nest. When she comes out, importantly, she notices that the world has changed. So the world doesn't look the same. And because the world has changed, she performs a series of inspection loops around the pine cones, learning about the pine cones. Then she flies off on a foraging uh, route to try and find a bee or some other uh, hapless uh, insect that she might hunt. And when she comes back laden with food, uh, Tim Bergen has moved the pine cones. So again, uh, another example of uh, a mischievous scientist. So he's moved the pine cones and uh, the digger wasp or the bee wolf comes uh, to the center. So we again, we see that she isn't able to detect the nest directly by any visual or olfactory cues that the nest might have. She'd learned the position of the nest relative to this pine cone ring. What's more, she'd learned it on one single learning trial. You'll be pleased to know that Tim Bergen reports that he felt so sorry for the uh, for the digger wasp that he gradually moved the pine cones back across to the side uh, so that she would uh, be able to find the nest because she was so intent at searching this central location. So again, this idea of learning uh, where you live uh, by the visual cues that are there is something we're all familiar with. Obviously, we all have some visual memory of what our front doors look like. Sometimes on some uh, dense streets might actually be quite important. Here's another example of, again, from, in this case, a bird, some animals learning their nest location, in this case, relative to how it appears. Now, this poor animal had the immense misfortune to choose a bike shed for building a nest. So, starts building a nest and obviously would learn what the nest looks like. So would learn how the nest appears in order to be able to make sure that when uh, they bring food, uh, twigs back to keep building the nest, that they're going to the right location. So bird brings back some nest material, looks at the bike shed, said, yep, yeah, this looks the same as what I remember. I'll put my nest material there. Keeps reiterating that process. But actually in this example, the poor individual is building something like 16 nests in parallel because all of these locations look the same. So in artificial environments, this kind of strategy might not work so well, but in the natural world, fortunately, there aren't many uh, locations that look identical. So we th think of this kind of behavior as an example of guided learning. So it's a beautiful interaction between an innate strategy and a learning strategy. So when the digger wasp comes out of the nest, she has the innate strategy to perform these inspection loops when she thinks the world has changed. And it's the inspection loops that enable her to learn the appearance of the world, which she uses then to find her nest. And we can see that in other wasp species with slightly higher resolution tracking. So here are two uh, Australian studies uh, with wasps. Here are ground nesting species, and we've got this beautiful flight pattern that increases with uh, width and height at the same time. And here are similar zigzagging behavior uh, as a wasp retreats away from uh, the nest location, which is here. So all of the time, if you look at the, these lines, the ball and line represent the head and the body axis. She's spending most of the time looking back towards uh, the nest location. Ants have to do this as well. It's more prominent in ants because they can't move sideways like wasps can. So here, when an ant is looping around its nest, here's again uh, a Greek species uh, of Cataglyphus and an Australian species, uh, Myrmicea. Uh, they're looping around the nest and at key points, they perform what we call a pirouette. They turn and face the nest accurately. And it's at these locations that they're learning what the nest looks like and what the environment looks like uh, in order to be able to navigate back. So you can see these arrows represent all the locations in this learning loop uh, where they turn and look back towards the nest. So it's easier to do for a flying insect, but it's still very really important and we see it in walking insects as well. So what we can ask is what do animals learn when they're learning about those places? What is it that they learn in order to be able to navigate back to that location? So here's an experiment uh, from uh, Formica rufa, kind of local wood ant to Sussex. 
uh, but this external experiment's done in the lab. So what we have, this is a top-down view of a, a white floor with two cylinders, uh, and we place food slides in between the cylinders. And then the cylinders and the food move around the arena over a few days, and ants learn to find the food uh, based on uh, the use of the cylinders. So the cylinders are the cue that they can use to find the food. Then we put the cylinders at a novel location uh, and we clean the floor, there's no food present and we record the ant as she searches for it. This is a heat map showing where the dark areas represent the areas where the ants spend the most time. And so they're accurately searching for the food, which should be in the middle, but isn't this time. They're accurately searching for the food defined by the cylinders. If we uh, take the same individuals on a second test and we make one cylinder smaller and one larger, we can ask where do they search? And they search close to the small cylinder and far away from the large cylinder. And crucially, this location here marked by the white circle is the point in this exp ex experiment where the appearance of the two cylinders, the 2D appearance of the cylinders on the retina of the ants is identical to this location. So they're matching a 2D snapshot of what they remember this location looks like. And that's a really, uh, we call it snapshot matching, and it's a really good strategy for finding a location. It implies that the ants have some kind of photographic memory, but they're only remembering the very raw visual input, and it doesn't need as much processing. We can then ask whether that might relate to ants that are traveling in more complex environments outside. So here's an experiment uh, with the Melophorus uh, desert ant, the Australian desert ant. And it's very hot in that part of central Australia. So it's always important to do experiments quite close to somewhere that has air conditioning. Uh, and in this example, we have a nest of, uh, of ants that luckily uh, were just next to a driveway in the house we were staying at. And so we'd go out, crumble some biscuits onto the floor at this location, go back inside uh, for a nice cool drink. And ants would train themselves to travel rapidly between their nest and this food going back and forth. Uh, because that's such a high value food stuff. And we asked the question is, what kind of visual information would they use to navigate from their feeder back towards the nest? So what we can do is we can see what the world looks like from that location facing in that nestward direction. So here's a human centric view of that direction. Uh, I've taken away the color information and I'm representing the fact that we have high resolution at the middle of our visual field uh, and very low resolution around the outside. Uh, something we're not really normally aware of because we move our eyes around a lot. But crucially, the direction the ant should take is just straight towards the house. So you've got this nice house feature here. Uh, and if you want to navigate towards your nest, just aim towards the house. But we, before we kind of assume that's what they're doing, we should check what this view would look like if we were an ant. So we can convert the image into an ant view and here it is, and you see that the house disappears. So for ants, we have very low resolution vision uh, and we also have panoramic vision. So we're taking much fewer photoreceptors and we're spreading them out over a much larger area of visual field. So this image here would actually wrap around the entire head of the ant so that on the left and the right, they would meet at the back. So this is facing directly backwards and this is facing directly backwards, this is the middle. So when you have a view like this, you can no longer recognize specific individual features. You know that there's something there that you can't tell that it's a house. You know that there are some things here, but you don't know which tree is which. But this shape of how the objects contrast to the sky is characteristic of this location and that direction. So maybe that's all the ants need. Maybe they don't need to know which, which object is which, they just need to be able to uh, kind of recognize that shape. So we took ants and we take them to a new location and we put them in the middle of this weird DIY, DIY arena. But crucially, we've done the geometry and the height of the walls of this arena have been designed so that from the center of the arena, there's stuff in the same locations as from the feeder facing back towards the nest in the, in the training location. So you can see we've matched these large trees with wide areas of plastic and smaller trees with smaller areas. What happens is the ants are perfectly happy with this 
showing that they don't need visual information to be precise in terms of objects or the distance of objects. They'll match uh, the approximate location of items relative to the sky and use that to set a direction. So it's a really robust navigational strategy, which doesn't require much brain power. We can simulate these kind of navigation in, in 3D models uh, and on robots uh, and using only very small neural networks, we can get robust performance, even in environments that are dynamic. So this robot is recapitulating the route run on the left. And even when people walk by, it isn't perturbed. This is a simulation of uh, the, uh, the environment for an ant called Catacophis velox, uh, which is in the deserts of Southern Spain. And you can see that even with these low resolution tussocks, uh, you've still got enough information to navigate this route. So just to finish, I'll give one example of what happens when the routes go wrong. So we've got these routes going through the world, but sometimes things might change. So in this example, again, the change comes because of the mischief of the scientists involved. Here we've got uh, Melophorus bagotti navigating from a feeder back towards their nest. So they're going from the bottom to the top of the page. Uh, and we've already dug into the ground a ditch. So this dashed line is a ditch in the ground, but we've put a board on top so the ants can happily travel over the top of it. And they'll learn this route and go backwards and forwards nicely. Then on the, uh, unbeknownst to the ants, you take away the board. And so now we have a live trap, a pitfall trap, that's totally invisible to the ants until they've fallen into it. So here you can see the ants start their run as normal. They hit the trap. And then this little marker here represents a bridge by which they can pop out of the trap. And then uh, after they've been trapped in the ditch for a while uh, and then get back towards their nest. So if you put this trap in place after 24 hours, you see that some ants learn exactly where the bridge is and they shoot down uh, immediately and aim for that location and then come out. And some ants learn to go around the trap. But the crucial thing is, how do they learn that new route that's needed now that the trap is put in place? Luckily for this Melophorus uh, ant, we have a beautiful marker of learning. When they're learning something visually, they stop their super fast runs uh, and they stay stationary for a small amount of time. And then they look in different directions. So we call it a scanning behavior. Here you can see it slowed down. Uh, they're actually quite hard to spot. These ants are normally moving super fast as you'd expect. So in this example, the ant is looking around because we've changed the environment. Uh, and so she knows she needs to learn something. So in this experiment, we just simply ask, where do the ants do their learning after their route has been changed? So we have a graphic representation of the, of the sequence of the experiments again. The crucial trials are early trials when there's no pit, the first time the pit is active, and then the first time after the pit is active. And we look for these scanning behaviors because they tell us where the ant is learning new visual information. So where do we see scanning? Well, before the pit is active, those roots are stable. The ants have learned them. They're just happily foraging backwards and forwards super fast. No learning seen at all. Interestingly, when the pit is first in place, obviously no learning before they've fallen in because they didn't know anything was going to happen. But even after the trauma falling into the pit, we don't see any learning on the second half of the route when they're aiming back towards their nest. So then they go into their nest, they come back out, they travel back around to the feeder and the learning happens on the first half of the route, the first time after the trap was active. So this is crucial. So they've remembered where they need to learn because you have to learn before the pit so that you can try and come up with a new route that goes around it or a new route that hits this bridge perfectly. So the ants have to keep track of the location in the world where they realize they didn't know what they should do. So the visual memories they have for this location need to be changed. And they remember that for the time it takes them to get back around and start their next foraging route. So a kind of a whirlwind summary, try to organize it. So we're kind of moving through the lifetime of a foraging ant, thinking about the different strategies it needs in its early foraging runs. And then as it develops experience of the world. And I guess the key themes that we could apply to ants in general and many other navigating animals 
is that each individual species has to be tuned to the particular sensory cues that, that relate to its own foraging and its own environment. And to do that, you need innate strategies which have to work on the first day of being a forager. And then you also need innate navigation strategies, otherwise you'd get lost on the first day. Then you can start to learn things and that gives you much more accurate navigation as you learn about your environment. But the real magic, the real sophistication where we see the intelligence and the interest in, in how these animals work is the interaction between innate strategies and learning. Because the animals have innate strategies uh, which are used to learn at the right location and at the right time. So these learning loops from Timbergen or the scanning behavior we see from our Australian desert ants are innate responses to the environment in order to make sure that you learn the correct things. So it's a beautiful interaction between nature and nurture. So that's all uh, I wanted to say. So thank you for your time. And I hope I haven't gone too far over so that hopefully we have time for a couple of questions if anybody has any.